Thank you so much, Julie. Thanks for that lovely introduction and welcome everybody. So, um, Julie just gave you a little clue, uh, or at least one, <clears throat> one piece of data uh, about this Parsha Nitzavim. And I want to ask before we dive in, does anybody else know anything at all about this Parsha? And what might make it noteworthy or what sticks in your mind about it? You can just put it in the chat. Anything at all about um, distinctive features of Parsha Nitzavim. Let's take a minute. Don't look at the source sheet unless you have to, in which case look at the source sheet. Returning to God, beautiful Tanya. So one big theme is it has this word shuv, which we, or the root shuv, which is where we get the word to shuva from many, many times in this parsha. Beautiful. Oh yes, thank you very much, Sharon. You were listening yesterday when I mentioned it was my bat mitzvah portion. It's true, even though my birthday is in January. Um, okay, yes, it has some very interesting stuff to being, it's about both the past and the future. Wonderful, I wanna focus in on that. This is, yes, it comes, so that's what I meant when I said Julie gave us a clue. It comes near the very end of the Torah. So this is coming towards the end of the last things that Moses says to the children of Israel. It could all be part of Moses' last day. Yeah, it's, it's um, yes, thank you, Danielle. Bechart Bachaim, almost at the end of the Parsha, have this wonderful, it's one of the most catchy phrases in the Torah. It says, choose life. I set before you today life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life that you and your children may live. Wonderful. Ah, oh, yes, and a wonderful, Dobby, thank you. Another great phrase from this parsha. The Torah is not far away. It's, there's another great phrase. Loba shamayimhi. It's not up in the heavens that you have to say, who's going to go get this for me? Nor is it across the ocean that you have to say, who will bring it? Rather, it's right here in your mouth, in your heart so that you can do it. So it's about the nearness and the accessibility of Torah. So wonderful, uh, beautiful. Okay, Ellen. Ellen mentions that it's, uh, it mentions that the whole congregation is gathered to listen, women and men, rich and poor, converts and homeborn, children as well. Everybody's gathered and everyone is receiving the Torah equally. Beautiful. Oh, it mentions also circumcision of the heart. Wonderful. Great, you guys are amazing. You don't need me between you this is this is what i love about learning together in a group that our collective uh, our collective intelligence our collective knowledge is so much greater than that of any one person so this is a great start thank you so when i looked through this parasha last uh, when i was preparing um this was one reason i wanted to ask this question because there are many gems in here it's a little hard to decide exactly where to focus i will say however Another, another um, aspect of this Parsha that nobody mentioned and which possibly stands in um, contradistinction to how full it is, is it's actually the shortest Parsha in the Torah. Of, of all of our weekly readings, it is the shortest. It's uh, less than two chapters. Chapters are not the traditional uh, Hebrew, um, uh, what's the word, like... Um, that, that we, don't, we don't have chapters in the Torah, that comes from the Christian edition of the Bible, but we've adopted them for the sake of simplicity and ease. But counted that way, uh, it's only a chapter and a half, many parashiyot of four or five chapters. And um, for that reason, amongst others, is very often paired with, with the next portion, Vayelech, um, although this year it is not, since this year we had an additional month of Adar. We had two, two, uh, two months of Adar um, in the late winter in the Northern Hemisphere. And, um, and so the, some of those double portions are split into two so that it still spreads uh, across a longer time period. So Nitzavim is the um, <laughs> one thing I learned about that. Uh, my bat mitzvah was on a Monday, it was a Monday Rosh Chodesh, and I learned that because it's the shortest parsha, usually on a Monday you only read Rishon, the first um, section of the parsha, but because it's too short, you have to read Rishon through Shlishi, the first three sections. That's not what we're going to focus on. However, before we continue, I would like to um, make a blessing 
onto our study so that we can drop into the sacred space together. So let's bring our intention and focus to receive directly from the divine teacher who's giving Torah in constantly, who's speaking the world into being, and bless that process. I'll say the bracha for us, and then you can all say amen, if you wish. Blessed are you. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu, Baruch HaOlam Asher Kitshanu B'mitzvotah V'tzivanu, Asok B'divere Torah. You make us sacred through this practice of getting deep with the Torah. And we pray that you make the sweet in our mouths and the mouths of our children and our students and all of our descendants so that this Torah can flow outwards in a stream of sweetness to us, the Jewish people, and the whole wide world. Baruch Ata Adonai Amenamed Torah Ve'amo Yisrael. Blessed Amen. You are teaching Torah to your people, Israel. Thank you, Judy. Okay, so I, uh, Judy has kindly put the um, link to the source sheet up into uh, in, in the thing. Is anyone not able to copy and paste that? Do you want me to share my screen so that you can see it? See what we're looking at together? That's probably helpful, right? Okay. Okay, so um, would somebody read for us this? Uh, you have to raise your hand using the little icon thing so that it pops to the to the uh, top of the queue. Can they can they unmute themselves or no? Um, if you raise your hand or let me know you want to be unmuted, I'll unmute you. And is there any way you could? Um expand the text make it a little larger is it too small sure yeah, yeah it's a bit small like maybe there's a full screen mode is that oh, there you go you don't see that yeah, yeah that's better okay. great cool thank you uh david are you raising your hand because you would like to read for us this first source or because you would love to say something all of your own david k that is oh you can't say anything can you okay david you should be able to unmute we're not going to say anything. I'm going to read the first section first in Hebrew, and then I think everybody else can read it in English. Yeah, read it in English for us anyway. Some people might not be able to look at it. One English first. Okay. Great. Go you, you stand this day, all of you, before your God, Shem, your tribal heads, your elders, and your officials, every householder in Israel, your children, your wives, even the stranger within your camp, from wood chopper to water drawer. Do you want me to read the Hebrew also? Um, no, that's okay. Thank you, though. Uh, thank thank you. you. Beautifully read. Thank you. So what do, what do folks think? Why does it begin this way? What do we get from this image of the people being gathered in this way? You can... Want to put in the chat? Right, it's an image. It's it's equalizing. Whoop. And inclusive. Right, it suggests that the Torah itself is an equalizer. Oh, I like that. Thank you, Laurie. That is acknowledging the magnitude of the experience that everyone has to come together to kind of hold the field of of what's happening. It's so profound, um, including women and children standing shows respect yes the word actually nitzavim it means something more like mustard but yes we translate it as standing i think it does it, it means more like gathered but i think it, it standing might be implied and i like that read and god sees all humans as important and involves everyone uh even the stranger within your camp non-hebrews yeah so the the later rabbinic tradition go uh, whether a ger is someone who's not a member of the tribe or is someone who's liminally a member of the tribe or someone who's joined the tribe is open to much interpretation and in, in later thought. Uh, but yeah, it seems to be someone who wasn't originally a member of the tribe at any rate. Mustard like soldiers are mustard, exactly. Tzav, uh, a tzava, like if we think of tzava marom, the, the host of heaven, the host on high, it's the same word, like the legion, uh, or we, when we call Hashem tzavaot, the God of legions, 
and my Tabawat is the same, it's the same uh, root as Nitzalim, I do believe. Um, so Tanya says, were jobbers and water drawers were people subjugated by the Israelites, which is interesting. And I did, did come across a source um, about, about that, which is not something that I ever thought about, ever, ever realized. I just assumed those were, you know, someone's got to do it. There are people within the Israelites. And um, later during the conquest of the land, there's stuff about wood choppers and water drawers. I didn't go into it. So maybe Tanya, you can tell us more. Um, interestingly, actually, the Maimonides, <clears throat> Maimonides draws on this line in the Mishnah Torah, which is the third source. He goes a different direction with this thing about uh, wood choppers and water drawers. Maybe someone uh, would like to raise their hand and read for us um, this third source where it says Mishnah Torah, Torah study 1-9. Thanks, uh, Tanya. All of you standing today. Oh, no, the, ne the next one, please. The, oh, the okay. Skipping one. Some yep. of the great scholars in Israel were hewers of wood. Some of them were drawers of water, and some of them blind. Nevertheless, they engaged themselves in the study of the Torah by day and by night. Moreover, they are included among those who translated the tradition as it was transmitted from the mouth of man to mouth of man, even from the mouth of Moses, our master. Thank you so much. So what, what, is, the, what is Maimonides saying? What's, what's the point that he's making? He's saying... You know, it's not that all the rabbis were very rich guys. The, some of the greatest sages, this thing about tra the parts of the trans translated the tradition it was, as it was transmitted from person to person all the way down from Moses, meaning like they're central to the tradition. They're the authoritative voice of the tradition and they were not rich. They were, they were dead menial labor. They were water drawers, they were choppers of wood and there was no shame, no shame in that. And and it didn't stop them. I think that's the other thing that Moses is saying. Even though they had to work hard and they were tired from their work, they found the energy to study Torah. So I think it's a, Maimonides is reminding us that whatever our social status, whatever our economic status, we can find it within us. There's actually, um, there's actually some fascinating stories in the Talmud about the different social status and in fact, the rabbis may be not even knowing uh, each other's economic background. There's, there's a very famous story of where one, one very rich rabbi goes to have a reconciliation with another rabbi that he's, he's been in conflict with, and he finds out that he's a charcoal burner, which is like at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder. And he finds out that he lives in enormous poverty, and he, he doesn't know it until this point. Anyway, I think that's, that's pretty interesting and kind of a kind of um, a good thing to note that it's not just that it's inclusive of women, which is wonderful for us, um, but also inclusive, not just of rich, but also of poor. The Torah is for everybody. <laughs> Carol asked the question, how, do, or, uh, how did the blind study? And indeed, as Danielle says, from listening to others, many people uh, didn't read and write. Um, and there used to be a person called, well, there were different, different roles, but people used to know the whole thing by heart. And that it was an important social role. They weren't necessarily the greatest commentators on Torah, but they were needed because they could, not just the written, not just the five books of Moses, but the Mishnah and the Talmud as well. They would be able to just recite it. And we find this still more in the Muslim world that, um, People can recite the entire Quran. There are people for sure in the Jewish world who can recite the entire Torah, uh, but it's not so, it's not a big thing that we focus on now that um, printed materials and, and the ability to read and write is so much more uh, widespread. Thank you. It's a great question. Um, <clears throat> okay, we we are going to take a little bit of a, a lightning uh, tour through this wonderful parsha. Um, so somebody mentioned before 
this um, this issue of it's not just static in time, it's written to the past and the future as well. And in um, in the fourth, in the fifth source, where uh, verses thirteen and fourteen, God says it's not just with you, velo itachem levadachem, it um, that I'm making. It's not just with you that I'm making this covenant and and swearing you by oath today. But both with those who are standing right here with us today, before the Lord our God, and those who are not here with us today. So anything in particular that makes you think of? Who are these who are alluded to who are not here with us today? Daniel says, Dor Vador, from generation to generation. So does that imply the, the past or the future? Oh, Greta says, I read this as simultaneously more, more simultaneous mourning and hope, looking both backwards and forwards. Beautiful. Us, says Carol. This is referring to us. There uh, was some kind of Jewish internet dating site at some point called Saw You at Sinai. There's this idea that all the Jewish souls that would ever be present, including souls of people who would not be born Jewish, but would come find their way back to Judaism, were all there were all part of this like outside of time and space experience to future generations yes both and the generation that went out of Egypt right so there are also we know that by the time they get to be on the verge of entering the land which is where this portion is given <clears throat> that a whole generation has died so it's also re addressing those who went out of Egypt but didn't make it this this far and people yet to be born yes Okay, so it implies all of us, and we, we, I, maybe because I have this connection because I studied this parsha when I was young, but I've always felt that there's something quite mm, beyond time and space about it, that there's something very powerful in this parsha and the way that it invokes our communal presence and the fact that all of us have received this um, down to this very day and down to the future generations who are not, who are not yet with us. So, um, it, this idea of like things being things being put in trust for the future, or things being secreted within the text um, that will only be actually be revealed in future generations, comes just a few verses later, also in this parsha. Um, I'm looking at source uh, source number seven. Would somebody like to uh, read for us source seven from Deuteronomy twenty nine twenty eight? You have to raise your hand so I can see you, or so Julie can see you. David Epstein. A concealed acts concern our God, but with overt acts, it is for us and our children ever to apply all the provisions of this teaching. Thank you. Slightly uh, dry English translation here. Hanista wrote the hidden things which is a, a a mystical word also you know everything which is beyond the scope of our comprehension but even if you don't speak hebrew do you notice anything interesting over here in the uh in the hebrew portion of the text i'll give you a clue it's right here if you can see my cursor right so i'm gonna ask julia if she has anything to say about this in a second because um, you may, may know that Julie uh, is a Soferet, she's a Torah scribe, but Julie uh, wrote a Sefer Torah in public uh, at the, the Jewish Museum in San Francisco over the course of a couple of years, a few years ago. And are you the first woman in the world to write a full uh, Sefer Torah? No, but one of the first that we know of uh, in, in our times. Um, it's amazing. So. Throughout the Torah, there are these occasional, very interesting, like little scribal things, like a, an extra large letter here or a tiny letter there. They're unusual. It's not like in every parsha there's something. <clears throat> and very occasionally, there are these kind of mysterious typographical features, like here, where it says, and the revealed things, Vahanidlot, and then the next two words, Lanu Ulevanenu. Ad olam, for us and for our descendants until forever. 
each of those words for us, for our descendants, and then the beginning of until, forever, has these little dots over it. And I found a picture of what that looks like in the in the Torah scroll. In the, you see these 11, 11 little dots. So anyone besides Julie, any thoughts? Why are there these strange, these strange uh, typographical feature uh, over this, over these words? What do you think? Right, exactly. Same root as Esther, the um, Misterot. Interesting diacritics. So they don't, have, they don't, they're not rendered in any particular way uh, in how we pronounce or chant the text. Ah, so it, it's in, so you could say. Uh, Mike says it indicates rabbinic changes, meaning it puts into the field the idea that the things which are for us and are for our descendants means the text is a bit unstable. It's going to get reinterpreted over the over the generations. Uh, Linda says it's for emphasis. It could be for emphasis. Yeah, absolutely. It could absolutely be for emphasis. Emphasis. It it does emphasize it. Whatever else it does, it it, it you're like what, what's that? It's like like italics or underscoring. Uh, the Torah doesn't do in italics or underscoring. Acronym says David from uh, David K. Uh, meaning what? What does it stand for? If it's an acronym. I don't. I don't know. I don't know what it might be an acronym for. Uh, Julie, I wonder if, <coughs> as a sepharic, <coughs> you have um, you have any um, insight or ideas about these uh, these markings? Yeah, so um, they've been understood in a number of different ways. No surprise. Um, one way is that these are words that we're not sure were supposed to be in the Torah. Like maybe these words should be there, maybe they shouldn't. So there's kind of this hedging with the dots. Um, another interpretation is definitely emphasis. Um, and another interpretation is so emphasis in a different way, kind of like there's another aspect to this text. There's something under the surface. There's something different going on than, than what the word is actually saying. So a really common example of that is there are dots over when Jacob and Esau have their reunion um, after a lot of strife. Um, it says that Esau falls on uh, Jacob's neck and kisses him. And there are dots over the word and he kisses him. Um, and so some people interpret, some of the rabbis interpret that to mean that the kiss was heartfelt and like so loving, right? And it's the dots are there for emphasis. And then other rabbis say, no, the dots are there to say, actually, he didn't kiss him. He bit him um, because in part, the word for to kiss is very close to the word for to bite. So, but this idea that there's an extra element to be interpreted um, beyond the, the surface meaning of the word. Thank you, beautiful. Yeah, exactly. It indicates an instability. It indicates a mystery, which is, uh, and it, you know, you even have the word nistarot or hidden things in the same, in the same verse. It implies that there's, there's more here than meets the eye. There's something, there's something curious going on um i did in find in fact um find uh, a, a source which gives two two possibilities one uh, one is which to say that something is changing now because until until they enter the land they're not they're not in a state of collective responsibility for each other but in saying lanu ulvanenu adolan the emphasis is on like now we're coming into a more of a corporate identity uh, and more more collective responsibility, and another just as Julie was uh, mentioning this idea, uh, we're halfway down source uh, number ten, where it says according to a text known as the Masoret Hagadola, which means the great tradition. The Masoret often ha means having to do with like how the text of the Torah is um, remembered and transmitted. I don't know much about this text Masoret Hagadola. If it's all about that, it might be from the name. According to a text known as Masoret Hagadola, um, the dots are attributed to when Ezra, who is one of the characters from history, he was after the first 
the destruction of the first temple and the exile to Babylon, he brought the people back. And it's thought that it's really during that first uh, period of exile, about five or six hundred years before the Common Era, that the Torah, in anything like the form that we know it, began to get edited and compiled together. Sorry for uh, anyone to whom that idea is offensive, but um, that's what historians think is like some of the texts probably were much older, but the first attempt, as often is the case when um, when um, you know there's there's a great rupture and traditional or traditional forms are threatened, there's a desire to kind of write it down and make the uh, the official authorized version. So Ezra was the guy who brought the people back from the exile and had something to do with put, putting the, an early version of the Torah into the public use. So th this text, Masorat Hagadola says that when Ezra had to rewrite the Torah after, after being brought back to the land, where there were variations in the text, he, he was thinking about a future time when Moses, and I saw a different text that said Elijah, so in some future reckoning uh, with the great spiritual authorities, would challenge him and say, are you sure you got this right? That says, he says, because of his doubts, he placed the dots on top. So like Julie just said, it's more to say, like, we're not really sure that these words should be here. Or it's to emphasize that we're not really sure when we say it's for us and for our children, we're not really quite sure how much uh, leeway we really have to uh, make new interpretations through the generations or that we're really getting it right as it comes down to us and our children. And if Moses, if Moses was satisfied with it, he could just like erase the dots and it, and it would be fine. He was like, it's like, exactly like you're saying, it's like when you put a little editorial mark in the margin to say, do I need to come back to this? Is this right? And then you're like, oh, I can just erase the, erase the marking. Now, as a mystic, to me, it's, it's very uh, cool that there are 11 of these dots. There are 11 letters that each have a dot over them. Does anyone have any um, associations with 11? We know we've got a lot of associations with 10 in the Jewish tradition. Does anyone think of anything when I when I say eleven? I'm following the chat. Um, According to Rabbi D David Ariel Joel of Lewisville, there are 11 of them in Tanakh as a tikkun to the text. Do you mean there are 11 um, different places in the, in the Bible that you get these dots? Are the stars in Joseph's dream? Okay, he had 11 siblings. Yep. Ah, numerology, that we're on the right path. So in numerology, 11 is actually two, because you add up the numbers. So it's something perhaps to do with like partnership or this polarity or duality. Um, 11 different places in the Torah, very interesting. I never heard that there are 11 places in the Torah. So this actually is like pointing to the other secret places in the Torah where there are these instabilities or um, mysteries to be explored. I love that, Carol, that there are 11 candles when the last night of Hanukkah falls on Shabbat. Beautiful. I would not have thought of that. That is gorgeous. That's gorgeous. So these are the lights that continue to light our way. Of course, Hanukkah is um, one of the last holidays, uh, last until the 20th century, to be, um, to be added to our calendar. So exactly an example of, of our ability to keep uh, a keep expanding the tradition in a way that still has, um, is still connected to, is, is, a, is a continuing explication of, of the tradition. Beautiful. Um, um, oh, Rashi says that this alludes to the fate of Jews who have become so assimilated among other peoples that their Jewish origins have been forgotten. When the final redemption comes, these hidden ones know only to come 
known only to come, will be reunited with the rest of their nation and be restored to the status of their forefathers. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, if I teach this again, I'll try and include that source. Wonderful. So it's, it's actually indicating the instability of who, the, who will be counted as the children, the descendants in the future, and that there are hidden descendants scattered through the world. And of course, we also know there are many, many interesting ideas about the lost tribes of Israel. Many, many nations throughout the earth feel that they have some connection to, the, to a lost tribe or the lost tribes. Um, Oh, thank you very much, Julie. Um, so, somebody, oh, not known now, only to come. Yeah, will be uh, will be revealed only in the future. Thank you, Tanya. That's great. Um, so, somebody else, Dr. G, said Sifirot, which is what it makes me think about. So, you may know the mystical um, uh, idea that the the one way to think about or picture the divine is as a what's called the tree of life or the sefirot and i couldn't find the most wonderful picture but here is a picture um on the right here and what we notice is although there are usually counted as 10 sefirot stretch it which are a way of describing how god gets from being like the utterly inconceivable into being the fabric of this world a sort of uh series of trans, trans, different aspects, different lenses that the divine light passes through until it collects in this world, Malchut, at, at the last sphere. Can you see my cursor? Can you see that? Yeah. Um, the mystics also say that there is an 11th sphere, this one, Da'at. And interestingly, Da'at um, it is the only one that moves. When this is when the tree of life is patterned onto the human body, the um, keter is, as it were, the, the top of the crown or like above the head. Then you have the right and left halves of the brain, chachma and bina. You have the right and left arms, chesed and gevura. Tiferet is the heart or the core of the body, the trunk. The right and left legs, netzach and hod. The lower center and the reproductive center, and then. You could say Malchut is the feet. We could discuss that more another time. But Da'at is the one that moves up and down. It moves anywhere from the heart up to the crown. And it's pictured as being both the third eye and the throat. So this is the center of our awareness and our speech. You might know that the, um, the Lubavitch movement, uh, they they also known as Chabad. And Chabad stands for Chachma, Bina, Da'at, the synthesis of understanding of the right brain, the left brain, and the, um, the speech center or the center of awareness. So when I, this is me, when I see these 11 dots, I'm like, whoa, Da'at, it's implying this mysterious capacity that we have to synthesize and express. That's what it means that it's lanu ulevanenu, it's for us and for our descendants, that we not only receive it, but we have an ability to integrate it and express it anew in a way that has never been, never been seen before and is, is not stable. It's always in flux, it's moving. So for me, that's an exciting idea. For others, it may be a heretical and disturbing idea. Um, what do you guys think? Somebody likes it. Thanks, Danielle. Let's see. Oh, we just have a few minutes. Okay, so in, in our opening share, I was so pleased that people mentioned uh, many, of the, um, many of the other wonderful themes of this parsha. And as I mentioned, it's short, so why not go read it after this class? Um, it's chapters 29 and 30 of Deuteronomy. Um, so I want to skip, skip to the end. Um, we've already mentioned that this uh, that has this root shuv, v'shavta, v'shav, which is the same root as our word teshuva, coming back to our 
coming back to our intention, coming back to our highest self, coming back to our source that this whole season of the year, right, we're, we're coming up to Rosh Hashanah, it's, it's happening. Um, and interestingly, um, uh, the, the introduction to Deuteronomy in the Jewish Study Bible talks a lot about how, in, in a way, Deuteronomy is, it could be considered the first uh, text that poses the problem of modernity, meaning it's, it's thinking about how it will be received in the future. It knows that it's actually, Deuteronomy is probably written quite a bit later. It's probably written by the same people that wrote the book of Joshua. In fact, they're like two halves of a whole, but we make the, the somebody back in the day made the decision that like Deuteronomy is part of the cycle that we read round and round and round again. And Joshua is the first, the first book of the prophets that we don't read in the same cyclical way. But this interest in the historical distance between the past and present and the tension between tradition and the needs of the contemporary generation, the distinction between divine revelation and human interpretation are all in there. So one of the things that happens in Parashat Nitzavim is it has this like prophecy. It's like, in the time to come, you guys are going to mess it up, mess this up, and you're going to be kicked out of the land, and, and everything is going to go south in this really dramatic way. Actually, go north, more east, more literally. But, um, but then you're going to come back. You're going to come back and the covenant is going to be restored and you're going to come back into relationship with God. So even in this, the Torah itself is in some ways um, prefiguring this very human experience that we have over and over and over again. of not just like massive destruction and exile, which also has happened over and over again, but also on a more individual personal level. But we lose touch and then we come back. We lose touch and then we come back. And this is the dynamic of our lives, always running and returning. It's a good place also to plug this wonderful book. This is real and you are completely unprepared. The Days of War as a Journey of Transformation. I've been teaching this book. I know some folks here have been in that class too. Uh, all of the sessions are recorded and up on the um, My Jewish Learning YouTube channel. And the source sheets are up on Safari as well. So if you want to want some help cracking this book, it's a little dense. Uh, you could you could go take a look there, but really this work of teshuva is the work of a lifetime, as as Rabbi Lou um, writes about so poetically and beautifully. But as we come to the, to the last few minutes of our class, I wanted to come to like the the kind of romantic imagery that we get. This is sort of a, a divine love song, where God says, "It's not in the heavens, it's right here." It's right with you. It's very close to you. See this thing? I'm reading uh, Deuteronomy 30, verse 14. It's in source 15. No, the thing is very close to you, in your mouth and in your heart, to observe it. See, I've put before you this day life and prosperity, death and adversity. Skipping a few lines saying like, if you choose the right way, it's gonna go well. If you choose the wrong way, it's not gonna go so well. So choose life, choose life. This is at the very end of the parasha, this is verse 19. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day. I have put before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life that you and your offspring will live. So I'd like to ask everyone on a, on a very personal note to take a minute we all know that certain things could be considered choosing life, like um, like eating healthy food or drinking plenty of water is choosing life. Um, taking harmful substances into our bodies might be considered uh, choosing death. But on a more, on a less um, physical level, I'd like to ask each person, and I, you don't have to share anything if you don't want to, what for you feels like, oh yeah, I am choosing life when I do this activity. I feel in touch with my life force. And it might not be anything that literally prolongs you. I mean, for me, like reading a novel, I feel like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really alive when I do this. Or when I'm writing, I feel really alive. What for you is really choosing life? And on the contrary, what's, what do you sometimes do that you're like, ah, this is not life-giving? So take a note for yourself, feel, feel into it.
and if you'd like to, you're welcome to put it into the into the chat and also no pressure. Someone says, walking my sweet dog, I assume that's choosing life. Choosing to believe in myself. Reflecting on God's work in my life. Caring for family, both biological and chosen family. Singing and teaching. Getting out of bed is choosing life, especially when we're in grief. Laughing at ourselves as well. Getting up and walking. Yeah, very life-giving. Spending time in nature, appreciating the majesty of life. Choosing to see the good. Following God. Laughter. Hey, bother do talking to God at any time. Working the land, caring for farm animals and drawing. I'm just going to read the Choosing Life ones. So I encourage everybody, keep thinking about this. As, we, uh, as, we're coming to, um, as we're coming to Rosh Hashanah, it's not just about being judged by an external source. And remember, it's a, a judgment of great compassion. It's just seeing things how they are. It's not a punitive judging. What helps you actually feel in touch with life? And can you choose that a little bit more? Listening to music, playing music. It's a beautiful life-giving thing. Now, I like to finish classes uh, very often with a little bit of music because I feel like it takes it up into the next uh, into the next world. Lighting Shabbat candles, sharing a meal, beautiful. Not judging myself, beautiful. Um, so I'm going to share a, a little recording. It's just a couple minutes long. Um, I don't know that this is available anywhere on the internet. It's a friend of mine, a friend of Julie's too, actually, Rabbi Sheri Yaakov Fight, uh, who's gone on to produce many professional albums, but this was just something that um, I have on my computer for many years ago, but it's to these verses. Behold, I have put before you today uh, life and goodness um, um, so that you can put it in your heart and do it. So I'm gonna, I'll play Kikarov Alacha for, for this thing is very close to you. And then I'll blow the shofar and then we'll finish. הדבר מאוד מפיחה ולבבך לעשות טוב ראן נתתי לפניך היום את החיים ואת הטוב So since this is uh, almost our very last day before Rosh Hashanah, Sunday will be the... Actually, do we even blow shofar on Sunday? I think we may not, since it's actually Erev Rosh Hashanah. And we don't blow shofar on Shabbat. So this is our last day of hearing the shofar in the month of Elul. Uh, so I invite this uh, sound to be an awakening for all of us and a, and a reminder, please, to all of us to, to choose life.
And then if Julie has any more announcements, she'll share them and we'll close.